Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, the National Library of Wales's session, an illustrated guide to Welsh rugby, a conversation with James Stafford. Um, before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, pointers while we wait for people to arrive. Uh, this will be a recorded event and it will be available on the National Library's YouTube channel um, after, it's, uh, after it's ended. Uh, we advise that for, for the duration of the webinar, if you could switch um, to gallery mode to ensure that we're able to see uh, all three of the participants speaking and there'll be some slides coming up as well. So hopefully if you switch to gallery mode, which will be on the left hand side of your screens, if you're using Zoom, then uh, it, it'll ease the viewing view. Um, if you have any questions or comments along the way, you can uh, leave those in the question and answer box. Uh, and we'll be addressing them towards the end, uh, hopefully. Um, I'll just give it another minute while people are, uh, are joining. And uh, just uh, in, introduce very, very briefly um, that we've got James Stafford, who's an author uh, with uh, multiple publications. Uh, we've got Dr. Lloyd Roderick, librarian at the National, no, I'm sorry, Lloyd, at Aberystwyth University. And my name is Griffin Jones, and I work with the People's Collection Wales, of which more anon. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Lloyd um, to, begin the, um, to begin the session. Diolch. Diolch, Griffith. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, just so I'm a librarian at Aberystwyth University rather than <laughs> the librarian. The, the article is important there uh, before I have to have a conversation with my boss tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, about. Um, James, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Yeah. Really looking forward uh, to tonight to talking about your new book, uh, An Illustrated History of Welsh Rugby, which was published just a, well, a few weeks ago. Um, and it's, I've thoroughly enjoyed the book and looking forward to talking about um, how you put it together really and the importance of illustration to your work too. Um, but before we talk about the book itself, mm -hmm. um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the background to your work and career. And there was a fantastic interview on the uh, Blood and Mud podcast a few weeks ago when you talk about your life in rugby and you've got one of the best list of former clubs as a player. But obviously perhaps um, viewers today, if they were interested in the more um, uh, perhaps uh, a different sort of history. Um, that, that was a really good introduction there, but could you give us a bit of a background of your work and career and how you came up to write this book? Yeah, um, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, so I'm from ba born in Cardiff, I'm from Barry originally. Um, rugby family uh, for Barry Plastics, uh, grandfathers, mothers, sisters, everyone involved either playing or coaching or, or committee, um, and grew up an obsessive Welsh fan in the worst period to grow up as a Welsh fan in the 80s and 90s, so a pretty horrendous start to my early life. Um, but writing, as well as playing, writing was something I was always interested in. And soon after I got into rugby in about 1988, my mother bought me another Welsh book, actually. John Griffiths, a famous statistician, had done this book with every rugby international result ever at that point. And it blew my mind that... Um, they were playing rugby in the 1870s and 80s in Cardiff and when, or when cowboys were running around the world. And it kind of opened up this concept of the history of the sport. And I was always obsessed from that point on. And I suppose the last few decades I've collected those books um, and I've always wanted to do a history. And in my 20s, I moved to Dublin. I started a satirical rugby website called East Terrace, um, which kind of got me a lot of actual proper writing gigs with Welsh papers while I was in Dublin or Irish papers and so on and then over the years I, I got a lot of writing gigs with newspapers rugby programs rugby clubs etc and I'd always had this idea that, and I'm sure we'll talk about the inspiration now but I've written as a journalist I've written in my jobs have always been copywriting jobs and um, I did a comic book which is quite important to the genesis of this project um, in the 2000s I now live in Prague I live, went to London then I lived, moved to Prague and I wrote a comic book about Prague and through that I met a lot of great artists and when it came to finally doing my rugby history that comic book background even though I'm not an artist was, was really important. Yeah and I say that's that's a really 
a crucial part to your work because I'm familiar with your other work and, and it's I suppose you're quite a unique author your two most recent books are quite quite different and we'll perhaps touch yeah. on that in in, in the moment uh, but next question really because when we think about we're not short of rugby books in mm. Wales and there's different types as well I'm personally a sucker for all the autobiographies that are that are that are published and you know some are better than others and yeah. you know and some folks on different ways and are perhaps written in different ways but in terms of history books of course you've got the big names the big hitters you know the fields of praise and and what have, what have you as well but this is really quite quite a different book and obviously the illustrations are part of that but what is it that makes a different makes different to a general history yeah well there's a couple of things i mean firstly there hasn't there's not many chronological books that are up to date. I mean, the, most of the books, a lot of the most recent glut of chronological takes on Welsh rugby go back to the hundredth anniversary, you know, like 40 years ago, almost. And most of the books we get now are very trivia, but really good, but they jump around a bit of trivia, a bit of stats, and they're not in chronological order. And at first of all, I just realized it was a huge gap for a chronological history. Um, but also I'm, I'm a big believer in, I love Fields of Praise, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. It's an amazing book, but it was a book that was quite difficult for me as a child. It's very scholarly, and I love it for that, but it's not very accessible, and it's out of date now, but not very accessible. And I wanted to create a history that a 10-year-old could pick up and really enjoy, who was learning about rugby, and also a 55-year-old who's followed it all their life, and get equal pleasure from it in a different way. And illustrations, so I had the idea to illustrate it because I've been working with these artists. And I thought all these other history books, they always use the same photographs because obviously in the early days of the game, even to the 50s, 60s, there's not that many photos. They couldn't really do action shots. So when you do get these history books, they have great images, but it's the same images essentially again mm -hmm. and again. And also, you know, even for 10, 12, 15 year olds, you know, sometimes they don't connect with those old images. They're so it's like another world um that i thought illustrations could be a really good way of um like drawing illustrations a really good way of opening up that history and making it a bit warmer a bit a bit fun but also it allows you to be quite serious to be quite melancholy to do very different things with it and then and the final influence was i, I live in prague now i have some children and i was thinking like they're not going to grow up in this welsh background like i did um how am i going to teach them about this without sitting there every trying to bore their ears off and that was also a bit of inspiration that this will be something you know my children will hopefully enjoy and that also then gave me the influence to make sure there was a lot of social history in there as well and to contextualize it not just have bob did this in this game and john did this in this game i mean that that that's, that's certainly something that that uh, rings a bell with me uh, as well growing up early, early 90s in sin rugby history and i'll tell you know Something that, and again, your, your point making about all ages there, me as someone who's in their middle 30s, I thoroughly enjoyed the book there. But the thing that jumped out to me in reading it is me when I was about 12 years old, I'd have been all over this book yeah. entirely because I was interested in history generally, you know, my favourite subject in school or whatever it might be. But rugby was my main interest as well. But the thing I found really difficult as well at that sort of age perhaps and you know it was just just me of when you did read those histories or you, you tried looking at the history things and it was a bit separate really and it was a bit mm. difficult for me I found it difficult you know perhaps didn't even think to connect the two mm. and I'm giving the example like you'd hear about growing up in Clashley Albert Jenkins or something mm. you heard stories of Albert Jenkins now what I thought was really fantastic in your book to use him as an example there you I knew he was a steel worker and you'd hear that but then putting together what it meant for a top class sportsman mm. to be a steel worker and what that meant, impl the implications of that, the resonance of that in terms of the social and cultural and economic history yeah. as well. And I think that's a thread that's, that's done really well and in throughout the book. So that was something that was quite important to you as well. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've always loved history, but I always was amazed maybe growing up that not everybody loved history. And it made me aware of like, you know, I was the kind of kid that wanted to go to the museum on my birthday, you know, um, and my mates were like, mm. you know, and I realized that the other thing I, as I read, read a lot of history books all my life, and I've read a lot of sport books, is often there's this snobbery with a lot of historians, especially that sport isn't really that worthy to be in a lot of history books. But um, 
what people do in their spare time, what people do with their leisure time is huge to the makeup of a country's culture. Similarly, how governments use that, whether that's, I mean, it's happening now with the British Lions, you know, there's someone saying if the Lions all goes ahead, it's going to unite you know, the divisions of Britain. But however, see, that may be, but governments use businesses. In the old days, the mine owners wanted to have teams to unite their men and make them feel good. What people choose to spend their time doing is, is critical. And then also the way countries play, in Wales's case, the way we play rugby, reflects in, to some degree part of the national character and at some point then the national character starts reflecting how we play rugby and at all these levels and I think if you weave it in right it, it, it can fascinate kids and what I as much wanted to do was that maybe some kids who love history but aren't really into sport history might enjoy it but also some kids who only read sport books or don't really want to read history books might also go the other way and start to realize that these guys in these old sepia photos from 140 years ago weren't that different to us had the same problems had the same challenges and their lives have affected what how we are now in wales so i was trying to make a door without being too grand about it to both types of readers well. yeah yeah yeah, that's fantastic. And like in terms of thinking about a you know one theme that that I found particularly interesting, you know, on that note of like a social thing that was threaded through, when reading it and like these kinds of books, uh, thinking as a fan as from the rugby aspect rather than the history, I think you know you're naturally inclined to go to the uh, give attention to the period where your formative years with the sport and you know yeah. the things that got involved with you and for me that was the early 90s uh you know perhaps you know a few years after you, yourself James and yeah. I'm sure you know you you can remember I can remember I can remember now the funny feelings I get I got such a bizarre relationship with rugby league honestly because <laughs> of yeah. that formative relationship and if I'm quite honest I'll tell you after rugby union my favorite sport to watch is rugby league Mm -hmm. But yeah. even now, I've still got in the back of my mind the feeling of an eight-year-old, the disappointment and the confusion mm -hmm. a dis an eight-year-old had of feeling that Scott Connell's going north. <laughs> like this. Yeah. No, no, but that is something. It was quite a complex thing. And that is just like, you know, and there's these strange feelings then. I don't know, this is too, I don't want this to be too therapy, James. Yeah. But these that is such a complex uh, situation really and it's all tied into the history of the game mm. in Wales and that was something that I thought was really really strong um, and clearly expressed throughout is that history and through the relationship of well money professionalism professionalism or amateurism and throughout the course of the period you're looking at from the late 19th century on. Yeah I, I think we, a lot of us again a lot of us only picture the history for our lifetime or just before but obviously rugby league since it began in 1895 when the game split has been key and what's really interesting with wales is uh, obviously when you know for those who don't know much about it essentially working class men wanted broker payment expenses basically because they couldn't afford to take the time off or if they got injured to play rugby they'd lose their job and the game split over it because the uh, main authorities wanted to keep amateurism but when when that happened a lot of people expected for example the welsh a lot of working class players, the game was played by all classes in Wales, naturally would split to the northern teams that went to rugby league. Um, but and this is what's interesting in the book is why didn't it made sense that you'd think Wales would have played rugby league at that point. But we didn't. We retained rugby union because of what else it gave us. And I try to explore in the book whether it was our status to show our worth in the British Empire, the jingoism. You know, why did we not go? To rugby league and the other thing i think is really interesting is it's really sad how these people who went to rugby league were turned into pariahs essentially especially when you read about like the 1920s the economy was decimated you know people were leaving you know 75 percent unemployment in some towns and people were leaving wales in droves and then you had these young men who were just really good at sport had always wanted to play rugby in cardiff Arms park but had to take the money to provide for their family and we still had a resentment to them as well which is a horrible thing that we had this lingering resentment of these people who were just trying to secure their future because one broken leg and it's all over as well. So it's really interesting the role class plays in that as to why we didn't do it, why we, we you know, why players went, how we treated them and that whole attitude to professionalism and how much of it we did we stay with rugby union because we wanted to be a big team in a small pool because rugby union isn't a massively global game, but it was international. So when Wales performed well, it kind of gave Wales a status in the British Empire, effectively, and um, which rugby league wouldn't have given us. So how much did we stay with Union for those reasons? It's a really 
complicated, but I think most people just view it as, or in the 80s and 90s, as you say, we lost a load of good players and it was quite a simple thing, but it's obviously yeah. a lot complex and fascinating. Well, yeah, and it, again, it's a fascinating, just one of the many threads, isn't it? And I think now perhaps if we perhaps opportunity to have a look at a few of the illustrations, because it's an important thing and it ties in to your previous work too. And you mentioned you work with a comic book as well. And, and something yeah. you mentioned earlier on about wanting to make it attractive for younger people as well. I don't know whether or not it's uh, ironic that your comic and your graphic novel work is perhaps for a, a slightly older audience than your <laughs> history work yeah. as well, because the themes of it. But the, the illustrators and how you worked with the illustrators there's a uh, um, well there's a whole team of illustrators really taking part in it so how did you or the illustrators choose which aspects to go about mm -hmm. yeah well the interesting thing so for those this, this the main artist is Raluca Moldova and she's Romanian with no rugby knowledge at all and there's two Filipino artists with no rugby knowledge at all and then my niece who did the cover who's Welsh and uh, another Welsh artist but I was starting, and it was quite an advantage you know, in some ways, I was starting with people who had no rugby references, the main artist, Raluca. So one of the inspirations was that actually, when I decided to illustrate it, it was also partly because I was doing over the years, a lot of research into 19th century newspapers and early 20th century, because that period's always fascinated me. And if you, uh, the images we're gonna look at now, so this, this is like the kind of thing that influenced me. I love these old 19th century editorials that used <laughs> to appear in all newspapers at the time, but particularly th these Welsh ones from uh, an artist called Staniforth, Joseph Staniforth. And I just loved it, even as a child, um, the way they, you know, these old punch-like cartoons, they're quite problematic as well at times, and we'll come onto that later. But if you look here, um, obviously Wales has just won a triple crown. Uh, we, we're at, you know, the way they represent England's John Bull, um, Scott, you know, the, the national stereotypes are reinforcing. You have these kind of images as well. The personification of Wales is a leak here, screaming over a thistle. Um, also, as you can see in this one here, the images of, they're actually using images to tell the story of the game because photography wasn't possible that quickly into newspapers. Um, the next image as well is a really fun one because they used to have pen pictures that were just drawings of the players. And you also realize it that the information was fascinating. There's one of these pen pictures says the player is about 25 years old. You know, they don't even know the exact age of the players, but these were kind of images I would feed into the artist and saying, look, I want it to look this kind of feel. And then the next art, the next image is an art is a image from one of the artists, uh, Joseph Nichols of Arthur Gold. And this was me saying, I want you to capture that vibe, but in an updated way, but have that 19th century, 20th century vibe for those books. Um, and similarly, the next one is from R Raluca, but it's, um, you know, we'll see a few more later, but we wanted to capture that feel of those old editorial type pictures because they're beautiful as well, even if sometimes the content's problematic. I, I do really enjoy it, especially look, we saw an example of one from um, sort of late 19th, very early 20th century of the sort of thumbnail sketch and the pen picture profile. And that's mm -hmm. something you've carried on as well with doing the similar sort of format um, by decade for key players there. Yeah. I, I really like those as well. And I, I think, you know, something that rang a bell with me um, as my, my, I'm going to, Excuse the anecdote, but my father a, was a compositor, printer for the Tlatli Star, and one of his first jobs, issues, printing as a 16 year old, as an, as an apprentice, was doing similar sort of pen printing, similar sort of pen pictures and player profiles before an important match on the 31st of October 1972. Mm -hmm. now, I just thought I knew you, James, you'd be wondering how long uh, we've known each other for almost 20 years, how long it would take before I'd mention that. But it's done now. It's taken well, 19 got, minutes. Than I saw, but yeah. but, but you, you've done that as well in the, um, in the book there. And with those illustrations, did you have any particular favourites? Because or did any of the illustrators choose things that you might not have chosen because they were coming to rugby fresh almost? I, I think, yeah, I think, I I mean, I'm, I'm going to talk about the resources later, but I was quite heavy on references and what I wanted, but the artists are visual. I'm quite visual, but I can't draw, but the artists obviously come with their own take and they give, and I think actually the next image is a really good one. Um, 
the Ronda forward, which was this thing in the twenties where, uh, the, you know, before the war and in the twenties, we had these tough forwards, often policemen. And I wanted to have a player in a, in a policeman's helmet because we had so many policemen. Again, part of the reason because the coal mines were closed and all, we had all these police officers. And the way Raluca illustrated this was very different to how I would have done it, but much better. I said, I want him in the old kit. I want the helmet. I want the aggression. But the way she brought the poses or, or sometimes would do things was, was fantastic. Um, and then, as you can see on the next few images, there's a lot of the, um, there's a couple of, Dragons, lions were often used for Wales England games. The next image shows you like uh, a victorious Welsh dragon after defeating New Zealand. Um, and that inspired us then. So we told when Wales won, beat New Zealand in 1905, is the next image shows. This is our image now. We were considered the unofficial world champions. So we replicated that thing where they had spring box and dragons and kiwis and put our own twist on it. So it was really nice then to play with the format of that and then the next image is another one where the newspapers described arthur gold the great welsh center uh, it's a bit cropped here but he moved like a snake so we illustrated him you know with the snake which is something you can't do with photographs which is another reason um i kind of wanted to do that um so yeah those were kind of the images um and later on we'll come to dame wales but that was a really influential as well but we, this was the kind of thing i thought doing an illustrated book could do that will interest children because it's the images are lovely for children but also i think adults respond to them really well and you just can't do that with um photographs and i was partly inspired after i started it I, I, a couple of people have said it reminds them of like the horrible histories approach in some ways and that was kind of an inspiration for the series as i started it that idea that you know you use illustrations to kind of make powerful points but can make it funny but also just to be beautiful and the artists are really lucky i'm really lucky the artists are really good and they've delivered a fantastic final product well i think it's a good point really to to move on to sort of i suppose how you research and what sort of resources you used mm -hmm. for it because you mentioned you know how looking specifically the visual thing so um griffith um you can ask about some of the uh resources yeah well it, it's interesting is it because um so, so often we think of the resources they would be in a library in a museum in an archive um but as I'm sure you find out, th there are multiple resources available um, in various places. So I was wondering if you could give us an idea of some of the key resources you use, just first of all. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, on the most practical front, I, I've collected rugby books for 30 years and programmes and magazines. So I had this huge stack of, of, of stuff. Um, and when I started the project, I went on eBay and bought some of the stuff I'd had gaps in my collection. But I've always used libraries as a resource. And before this book, when I lived in Wales, Ireland and London, and when I lived in London, I actually lived five minutes from the British Library. And I used to do the old microfilms where I'd go to the old, and it was, it was an amazing resource, but you had to take time off work to do it. You know, uh, you had to request all the forms, sit there with the microfilm, you couldn't search by name. And I had some amazing materials from those years, but it's a very slow, not very practical purpose for most people who want to write. So when I started writing this book, I was living in the Czech Republic. Um, obviously, there's no microfilms of the Western Mail in even in the great libraries we have here. So the research, I had lots of books that had kind of an, enough in some ways, but I wanted to get some stuff that weren't in other books and really dig deeper. And when I found out, you know, a few years just before I started the book about the National Library's resources, for example, that the, all these papers up until 1919 were online. Um, and then the people's collection as well, which I, I can talk about a bit later with the photographs more. But when these newspapers were online and they were searchable, so you weren't just looking at date, it was it was a real game changer because not only could I look at any report I wanted to from the 1880s to 1919 in my case where I was looking, I could do it. I've got two children. I have a you know a full time job. I could do it at two o'clock in the morning, and I often did. You know, you can't without those resources available, this book wouldn't have been as rich because I couldn't have come flown over to Wales. If I had to fly over to Wales, I probably would have had two weeks maximum spare. There's only so much you can do in a library. So not only is the resource amazing on its own, the 24 seven nature of it is just, like I say, an absolute, it changed everything for me. And, I, and the fact that you can search by name because it's digitized to the extent, you can see the original papers, but you can search by name and it can find text of players is been amazing. And that, you know, as I said, 20 years ago, this book wouldn't have been possible to the same degree for me. And also, you know, um, it's given me a lot of material that I haven't used yet for other books and other projects. It's, it's been amazing. 
with the gaps in it, I mean, we, we know that, uh, you know, there are incredible resources, but just taking, for example, the Welsh papers, the Welsh newspapers online, um, and as you say, up until, you know, everything published up until 19 and searchable, um, mm -hmm. did you have any frustrating gaps along the way? I'm, I'm curious to find out. Yeah, with the newspapers, um, not so much, I mean, they've got everything you can hope for, and pretty much if it's not in a newspaper, it, it's, if it, any most books written on the subject are going to come from the newspapers anyway, so the newspapers were just so thorough, and if anything, I, I don't want to know how many hours I wasted, because you go into the newspaper, you find the article you want, and you see something next to it, and you, start, you go down these rabbit holes that have nothing to do with your book, um, and at one point I started researching people called just out of interest, James Stafford from the 1800s. And there was a story of a James Stafford biting someone in Wembo and you start going on these stupid rabbit holes that aren't helping you at all. But it's such an amazing resource for historians that, and as a historian, when you see these things, you click on them. So the newspapers were um, an incredible resource with not really much gaps, but you're obviously, you're just relying on what was written then. And then the people's collection, I use more for photographic um, references and what was really good for that is I found a lot of images and we'll, we'll look at them later, but I found a lot of images I hadn't seen before or I only had in a small book in really bad resolution and the people's collection had a couple of images I wanted much bigger so I could show the artist for inspiration. Um, but I mean, with the people's collection, it was brilliant. I, I loved, I think there's a huge gap generally in rugby of photography online. And I think that people at the WIU, all these unions and clubs have these archives and I'd love them to somehow start digitizing them all. Um, and that would, I think, would really change sport history research. Yeah, and, and uh, one, one of the wonderful things about the People's Collection as well, if you just a shameless plug here as well, uh, is that it's, it's a two-way archive. Um, you, people can deposit content, can publish their own material as well, um, identifying gaps. Uh, if they have a material relating to, in this case, a particular match, a particular club, a particular player, then they can publish and add their own story to the collection, uh, which of course is what we hope to see uh, here. People read the book and then yeah. I think I got one of those. And honestly, I, I was, I am planning to do a blog on my website about that to say like, and I've got stuff I need to scan, but, and, and I could probably contribute as well, but I would, I was actually going to encourage that because I have quite a nice little group of people. I'm always interacting with online through social media about the book, but about Welsh rugby history. And I'm sure a lot of these people, and sometimes they send me images that are fantastic. I've not seen. And yeah, trying to get those into the people's collection would be great because that's where it's going to grow is from the clubs, unions and players and fans, isn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's not, uh, it's so easy very often to put the responsibility onto museums and libraries and archives and these institutions to make content available. But mm -hmm. the fact is, uh, the world's largest collection of photographs, of memories, of uh, maps, manuscripts, it's all uncatalogued, undigitized in our homes, in our, in, on our bookshelves. It's the memories, uh, the, the memories and the content that we have as community. So yeah, it would be brilliant to see material come from, especially the clubs, as you say. I mean, they've got such incredible collections in clubhouses, very often, well, uh, may, maybe not deteriorating, but oh, sometimes, certainly yeah. not, not viewable easily. It's been really good. There's been a movement. I was in touch with like Swansea RFC are doing some amazing stuff at the moment with their archives and uh, Cardiff has a rugby online rugby museum that fans and, and people have set up and it's an amazing resource and um, I think I hope I think it's starting to create that culture of people sharing things and, and digitizing it um, so yeah it's it's again like the having the newspapers online it's a real game changer for someone like me who's trying to find these little stories or, or check these little references uh, just uh, one more question on that uh, I wonder were there any bits of history that you knew happened, but you just weren't able to find any, anything about uh, players or, you know, did you have dead ends in the research? A little bit. I mean, luckily, because the, there's so much I didn't even put in, I could, if I, the big questions I had the answers to, sometimes you were trying to find out, like, I don't know, like a reason why a certain player wasn't picked. And you, the books I'd read, it indicated there was themes in the press is about why you hadn't but I started to go and look for those and you can't always find it for, but it's that's probably more of a time thing but I there weren't many dead ends that I couldn't cope with I mean there's always a little bit where certain games aren't covered as you want or you you or the columnists because the columnists often didn't have names they were anonymous so they might write something referring to something but you can't quite find even with the searching option you still can't, can't quite pick up the thread or um so yeah you have those little dead ends but luckily I mean the only problem I had was the book 
quite literally could have been twice as big. I had to really selectively, but this is the great thing. You know, I have a blog now and I am planning to do like the deleted, ver no, the deleted extras, if you like to slowly start sharing those as well. And I've also been really enjoyable is because I've been sharing the progress on this book for the last two years on social media is seeing people not realizing this stuff's out there as well and going and then they're, they're going off and doing the same thing and posting screenshots of, of match reports they found and sharing it with me and other people and i think um it's been great on a really small level to wear, uh, raise that awareness um and get people going there because it is it is fantastic um I, I suppose another question um on that point is suppose like the the inverse of griffith's question just now rather than did you have any dead ends did you have anything that you came and stumbled across you know through serendipity just by accident that ended up being yeah. oh this is an interesting thing to write about the, the two the two big things was one um again i keep talking about the 1905 game but it was such a pivotal cultural moment and history moment but it was re i'd read all sorts of books on it quite you know literally books and reports but there were some fantastic little columns about what happened in Cardiff on the day that I hadn't come across before. Like people used to wear leeks, you know, the fans would put a leak on their coat and Cardiff market ran out. So they were wearing onions instead. And there were women waiting in the streets for their husbands after the game. And the women were cheering the result and cyclists going around Cardiff. Cause obviously there's not even radio then. So the, the result literally spread by word of mouth until the papers came out. So there were cyclists departing from the stadium, um, spreading the news, shouting out, you know, Wales have won and all, so there was some sailor dragged into a pub, he didn't even know what rugby was and made to get drunk and all these wonderful little tales that just really give a richness to the game and the history of the game I hadn't heard. And then the other thing was um, you stumble across these weird things like they use pigeons to deliver the results of games. Um, but the, the one I really liked was people forget that when international rugby started, the club game was king. And you'll see plenty of examples of players choosing to play for their club over Wales for the first 20 years, especially. But there was a real good bit on Welsh culture, that whole move of abstinence and the revivalist and religious movement and the movement against drink was after Wales' second game against Ireland, the Welsh game got 50 words in the newspaper, including the scorer. So it was half the details of the match and the, almost no words. But that same day, they had a huge, I say huge, but a significant column on a game in Swansea between teetotalers and non-teetotalers um and it doesn't quite go into enough detail without context but basically it looks like the, it was called the blue ribbonites who would like show they were teetotal and there were twenty-one thousand apparently in wales these part of this teetotaler movement but it's amazing that this exhibition charity i don't know what you want to call it game got four or five times the column space wales island did because that was the, what was important at that point or what was you know probably what the editor of the newspaper would cared about as well. I don't know, but those were the little things that you, you, I've never come across before or not much. And it's fascinating and it revealed, but it reveals about life then the culture, the way people lived. Um, Cause it's really hard to imagine now when we're on social media, watching the game that people had to literally hear about the result from word of mouth, but they all cared about it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And well, I think it's a good point as well. We could have a look perhaps at a few more images you mentioned you you know you're interested in the, the figure of dame wales the, yeah the map as well so and perhaps we could have a look at that and then some of the other uh things you found and how you use them a little bit in the book too yeah so i've always loved these personification characters in, in art or, or satire and so dame wales was a creation of joseph staniforth a welsh artist um edit, a cartoon editorialist western mail even express mainly but he would use this dame wales figure from everything from rugby write-ups uh, rugby stories to um quite serious political points and for him it was like a response to uh, britannia you know the way britannia was a symbol of the british empire it was like you know she was the sort of this character of stoicism and sense often, but this is a, a kind of a fun one where Newport and Glamorgan had lost to the All Blacks, but Wales is reclining on a couch with a victory laurel as celebrating his victory of New Zealand. But if the next image shows, she was also used, um, this is an image from the 1898 riots that were happening and she's trying to stop the, the police from going in um, and you know damage, hurting these protesters. So she was used in very sharp political cartoons to really make a serious point as well. And then the next image is an example, again, from 1905, but these stereotypes. So on the left is John Bull, representing England. 
the um in the guy in the background scottish the guy in the hat is the colonial which is the new zealander um and the guy in the middle is um an irish figure and i'm a bit unsure about the imagery here. i think it's meant to be some kind of fenian devil type figure i've asked around a few people about this but these personifications were, were really good and then a couple more images or um and then other cartoons you'll see in the next one other cartoonists took this image of dame wales on um this is the Scarlets after they lost to the Springboks in 1907. I'm afraid they're all getting cooked in the pot. And Cardiff um, successful when they. Uh, okay. Yeah, we the yeah, Cardiff smashed them a few days ago, but we won't mention that. And then the final, you know, there's another one here about um, Owen Morgan, a famous uh, kind of folklorist in Wales. He you know attacking the tenants of Welsh Christianity, and there's Dame Wales in horror as um, uh, Owen Morgan smashes the idol of, of Saint David. So I love this. I love these kind of cartoons. I've always had an interest in them. And then again, if you we use Dame Wales in the book at times, um, the next image sort of is one of our ones. We had a pop up in some of the, oh, so the next one. This is the, the final one. This is rugby league one. This is about two famous brothers from Swansea who went to rugby league and uh, went north, and it devastated Welsh <coughs> fans. And this is Dame Wales like weeping as, as, as she as they disappear to a magnet, and the magnet represents money. Um, <laughs> So we wanted to have this character in the book and the next image is Raluca Moldova's um, interpretation of, uh, it's a bit crop, but of, of Dame Wales. But she's such a fun character and I, I, it's a kind of shame she's in some ways disappeared from this car, you know, not used that much now. But this was the kind of thing that was just really interesting to see and to see the way, and all these cartoons when they weren't sport were quite politically, obviously very political. So you get a nice sense of the politics of the newspaper and, and apparently Staniforth was kind of quite liberal labor, but his papers were often quite conservative. So a lot of these cartoons are what he's being told to do rather than maybe his own figure, uh, his own views. So that's something I'd love to find out more as well. Yeah. And there were, there were a handful of, you had a, um, a few images relating to, 1905 and I suppose mm. just to move towards that a little bit yeah uh, now I think uh, is, is if this is a good time uh, yeah yeah, yeah um, um, just to um, think about well the re bringing it up what you're working on next really and obviously there's research around the the famous match in 1905 in the present book but you're, you're giving that a bit more focus now yeah, so the 1905 game is kind of the most famous game in rugby history even, and it was the first time Wales sung the national anthem before a game, first team to do it. That became part of international culture for sport. It defined rugby as the, as the cultural game of Wales, if you like, for both and New Zealand too. It's a really, and it's an amazing story. And I wanted, I'm now doing a children's book with Karis Fee and my niece on this topic. Um, and one of the great things is, again, using these archives to go a bit deeper than what I've read in all the books, but this is an image of the 1905 team. And it's one I'd never seen before because it's from the people's collection. It's taken a slightly different angle and they're all not quite ready for the photo. And it was great to find these little bits on the people's collection I'd not seen before. Um, and then I'm using these references if, if you, and I use them for this book too, but then the next couple of images, these kind of close-ups, which they're obviously taken at halftime, or, or do you, um, but you don't normally get that kind of close action or close, images from that era and these are fantastic for me because I can share these with the artists for this book and the last book to give a bit of character to say this is the kind of way it looked the clothing to really inspire the feel um, and the next image is a fantastic one of the players on their halftime oranges and then the next image is one of an eight it could be a South Wales team it looks like some of the guys are from Neath but you know, I really wanted to capture this kind of feel in the art. And this is, these are the kind of references I was taking from the people's collection and, and sharing with the artists and saying something like this, you know, this atmosphere. But um, yeah, I'm doing So this book's going to be like a 48 page children's book aimed at like seven to eight year olds. Um, and it's kind of using the story to tell people about the value of hard work and, 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 and um, thinking and not, you know, not just hard work, but thinking about what you do and, and, and being, you know, being good at what you want to do and not giving up on a lost cause, you know, the classic children's themes, but I want to use that with the 1905 game. And um, it's, it's going to be coming out in October, but I'm really excited about it. Cause again, there's no books I can think of like this where I think it's, we'll, we'll come to an illustration that's coming from it as well, but it's a lovely way to teach young children the history of the game, but in a fun story way that has characters in it and builds up. Um, and hits all these traditional children's tales 
spots. But um, also then, again, I'm hoping the parents, I think the parents will enjoy it too. Um, and again, just open up that door and to bring these distant figures alive. Because I think we don't have the image. One of the reasons, as great as we were in the 70s, the fact that colour TV was around is one of the reasons that era is still alive and so dominant. And, you know, the, arguably the team of the early 1900s was more successful and more innovative and, and maybe greater in some other ways, but they're distant figures in history. And I love this little book is maybe just some way to keep alive what they were doing in some way, bring them back to life in, a, in an accessible way for kids. And also I'm sure there's going to be inevitable jokes. It's almost like a fairy tale because the idea of beating New Zealand now is like a fairy tale. So it possibly crosses into children's fairy tale territory as well. And could I just jump in there as well and say that um, it's not even a fantastic way to keep the um, you know, the characters alive and, and, and the stories, but just to pick up on what you said earlier, um, it's such a fantastic insight to everything surrounding that period. Like you said about you know the, the, the pigeons and the, the women in the street waiting for their husbands to come out. Um, so much the richness of yeah. the incredible stories of that time, even regard even even forgetting the rugby. Um, is incredible. I've learned so much about the history of Wales by reading this book. I mean, outside of the rugby, and I'm always suspicious of uh, Lloyd, you know, trying to palm off massive <laughs> biographies of Senesi back rows um, <laughs> that I was really excited to get something that I, yeah, just got completely sucked into. So yeah, it's fantastic, not just to preserve the characters, but the, yeah, the entire culture. Yeah, and what's interesting, so this, the, the illustrated history book, the first one we were talking about, this part of a series, I'm already kind of six months into the, the England follow-up. And what's really interesting is how different the histories are going to be. Because this, the 1905 game, that game was, um, we can't even imagine how big it was because it was these foreigners coming over from the far distant colonies, um, sweeping all before them. You know, no, no one had seen anything like it. There's no TV, there's no radio. So you're just hearing about it and you're just reading about it. And the whole country, when you read the newspapers, the whole country is interested. People are finishing work early to walk there, get trains there. The whole, and the country's putting its pride on it, rightly or wrongly, Wales is seeing it as a reflection on their character and their manliness and their national you know, statehood, all this. But when you, were, now I'm studying the English game of that same tour, it's a big thing in the rugby community. And that's it. There's not really a wide, you know, most people in London probably didn't know it was on when England played with Crystal Palace that day. So what I'm finding fascinating is the same tours, the same games, is how differently they were reflected. So when you go into the Welsh archives, you're getting all the stuff about the life around it. Like you said, the women in the street, the fans pulling people in the pubs, the cyclists. But when you're studying other countries at that period, you're not getting that same wider social impact. So this history is particularly fascinating, even though obviously I'm biased because I'm Welsh, but it really is so such an insight into the society around the game as well. And then just the last couple of images, I think while we're on the 1905, we've just got a few images left, but a bit more problematic and sometimes, but we have. Um... Yeah, that was, I'd say that was the, the next question really is yeah. when you are, you, we have alluded to it already in terms of when these figures are um, put in character of form and stereotype is perhaps the uh, gentlest way of putting some of them. Uh, some of them are just harmless-ish perhaps with. Yeah. Dame Wales, Dame Wales, but others are less harmless uh, yeah. as well. So this is one when Wales, I mean, basically, again, there's John Bull and Scotland and Ireland personified and Wales have just beaten New Zealand. And the idea here is, uh, you know, the other unions of the team saw New Zealand as this terrifying spectre, a shadow and Wales revealed they were just human. A little bit, again, some of the characters are a bit, mm, but fine. But this is where you see some really troubling even at the time, I would say, but really troubling to look back on. Um, here, again, this is an image of a supposedly a Welsh player teaching New Zealand, because New Zealand had changed the game and we actually beat them, the idea being actually Wales had the lesson to give. But they've um, illustrated New Zealand as a kind of this very stereotypic, grossly offensive Indigenous character, and obviously nothing relating to Maori culture at all. I mean, it's completely inaccurate and horrible and offensive. And there's another one on the next page, but this was a really common... Um, way of illustrating, uh, oh, sorry, go back one, sorry, I thought it was no one. But this is a really troublesome thing to look at now. Um, but it's fascinating, it's important to, to, to remember how far we've come and, I, and these kind of racial issues which are much more prominently discussed and you know, 
back in these newspapers. So one of the challenges I had with the, the illustrated history book was I wanted to address them and I addressed them to a degree um, I, I, to try and show the younger readers, you know, the racism of that society or the, the lack of understanding of other cultures. And um, I think it was an important part of the book, but it was a bit of a tough, I don't dwell on it too much, but it's something I wanted to put in there because um, I think it's important. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, I say, I suppose that is a balance in writing a book when you are thinking about your audience. To what extent, how do you, how do you uh, blend in your wider history with the sport as mm -hmm. well? Uh, and that yeah. was part of it there. And it sort of is really important that that's included in, in that, uh, in the illustrated history yeah. as well. We did have a it flash on the screen uh, for a second. Can we go back to the example? Is this a, a little sneak preview from Yeah, your... so this is uh, Karis Fien's preview of the... Uh, the new book. Um, this is Teddy Morgan. It's not finished. It's in draft stage, but um, we're, this is the kind of art style we're going to have. Um, we've tried to make it as historically accurate as possible. So he scored towards the Westgate Street end of the Old Arms Park. So we've tried to make sure that what we're seeing, but there's not any photographs of that part of the ground at that time, but what we think the ground looked like. But yeah, this is the kind of art, this kind of classical old school children's illustration that we think could really in engage children. Um, it's recognizable, that's clearly rugby, that's clearly a Welsh kit, but it's also I hopefully fascinate enough for young minds to see the difference in it as well. So this is the, the, um, the artwork uh, style. I'm really excited about it. Um, and obviously some of the pictures were the game, but a lot of them are gonna be uh, the players in their everyday life. And it was the dawn of, you know, this, New Zealanders were away from home for the best part of a year and they traveled by sea and we've tried to make it almost into like a epic classical tale of players, you know, these fearsome warriors coming from across the globe. We've tried to kind of give it that real kind of like um, epic quality as well to engage children and make it uh, exciting. And also reflect the attitude because it was this big thing you keep coming across in the old newspapers of gallant little whales, you know, little whales standing up. And we've kind of tried to play with that a bit to talk about, you know, because that's how whales saw themselves, rightly or wrongly. And we've tried to play with that a bit. Um, so yeah, it's it's really exciting, and we say we're just at the, the start of it. Oh, great. Well, you mentioned briefly as well that you've got your you've reinvented these terraces. Now I remember these terraces from its early days as the yeah. satirical, and I'm sure like a, quite a few people um, listening in would be familiar with these terraces and some mm. of the famous satirical articles that might have caused a bit of a stir. Uh, but we won't go into that too much. But you've relaunched that now. That's tying into your work with it with a history project yeah i it's kind of like the dvd bonuses i guess i couldn't um between doing the books it was very hard to keep the oldies terrace going and i'd kind of done satirical stuff it was like the first website to do that but i kind of done all i could do with that i felt I, and i felt like after about 10 years it was kind of just going to be risk doing it for the sake of it so i kind of put it on hiatus for a bit um, and i realized there was so much stuff i couldn't put in this book um, and again, all these things I was finding on the on the archives and the newspaper archives, that I just couldn't fit in that were absolutely fascinating. So I decided that the website is, among other things, is still going to be commentary on the modern game, but it would be a great place to share um, things I couldn't explore or, or things I gave it like a, a paragraph to that deserve their own section. And I'm kind of, um, yeah, going to use this, these resources again for this blog and for my next books as well. But these archives we've talked about and the national newspaper archive i'm just gonna be drawing on them constantly because i think people love these stories but you can't produce a ten thousand page book so i think the blog is a nice way to get that out there um get people interested in the book and the book hopefully will get people interested in the blog and, and vice versa so i'm really looking forward to it because there's some fantastic stories i just didn't have space to tell and should be told well um and i've only got one last question uh before maybe having a look to see if there's any questions come in on the chat. Uh, Griffith, do you have anything before I come in with my zinger? I did, but we do have a few questions, so I'll I'll, I'll pass and then leave uh, the audience to, to ask instead. So you go for it, Lloyd. Well, the last last one, James. I know th what I really enjoy as well, there's really, really comprehensive stats in the book as well, which I know I think your father worked with you on that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and really it's really so. great because, as you mentioned, there's those kinds of things that... that you mentioned yourself and I got interested in those sorts of appendices in, in different books, uh, sports yeah. history books there. Um, did you expect that potentially it might be out of date in terms of the number of Grand Slams? No, in the publication? I, so 
And will it be? Yeah, I've got to give a shout out to my father. So I built a new database of Welsh results um, from scratch. Although there's some out there, I wanted to include everything, the kit they were wearing, the um, number of yellow cards, red cards, everything. So we started from scratch. And my dad alone did about 100 hours on the stat table, which not most of it's not even in the book. It was just to build it. Um, and it got quite obsessive. But the heartbreaking thing was then that the moment the book came out for the start of the Six Nations and the moment the first ball was kicked of that game, <laughs> Technically, all the stats were out of date now. Um, and just for those who haven't read the book, it's an appendix at the end. So the rest of the book, you don't, you know. But yeah, it's heartbreaking. And But I certainly know, I actually, because we have all the re- stats for the head coaches and Wayne Pivak had a horrific 30% when we launched the book. And yeah, if I'm honest with you, I thought Italy was going to be the win and that was it. Um, so no, I, but I, I'm hoping there's a wave of interest. We sell out the book and then I can quickly do an update. Next print run, next edition. <laughs> Um, but no, I certainly did not expect that that could potentially be added to the Grand Slam figures. That's good. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, we have another uh, few questions. Um, one, very interesting about you know, the purpose of the book, the use of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, does James think that this sort of book could appeal to older members of the community who are suffering from dementia or experiencing mental health difficulties? Could it act as a platform for promoting their reminiscences, um, such as, I imagine, you know, in, in reminiscence work, I use photographs or items to promote um, memories. What are your thoughts on that, James? That's an amazing question. I mean, I hadn't considered it, but I, it's a fantastic I. Uh, Thing. And I think, I guess the book, I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm obviously no expert on this, but the book is very much, you can read it. Some people have read it in a sitting, some people dip in and out of it uh, day to day. Some people go straight to their favorite period. And I know talking to my dad's friends, and my friends, and they all immediately go to the era yeah, that they grew up with. And they, I've had people say, is, is Don Hayward in the book? Is this player? Is Albert Jenkins in the book? And they go straight there. So perhaps, yeah, people are going to go to what they like and what they know. And part of it and as I say the appeal for the younger people everything pretty much until the last 10 years is going to be new but for older people it's it is also a trip down memory lane um so if that helps someone you know yeah that that could be a it would be lovely to think that someone with that condition might get some comfort from it or enjoy it or get their memory sparked yeah if I could add to that as well um I I think personally it would work fantastic in conjunction with other resources um we, we, we know that visual content is a fantastic stimulus uh, for, mm. uh, for reminiscencing, reminiscencing. Um, and using this in conjunction um, where you can go back to a specific match and ask questions about it and about the players in conjunction with maybe the resources on the people's collection where there's a photograph available yeah. uh, would, be, uh, would, would, would be excellent, I think. One project I am thinking of doing when I have the time, but I have this database, it's just a, basically a spreadsheet online of all the results I update, you know, all the captain, the referee, you know, national, all the stats, was I was starting to add all available YouTube clips or Pathé film clips into this spreadsheet. And then I was thinking I could slowly add like, you know, photographs, just a link. So I'm not hosting it, but it's like, you know, this match all the stats on the match and click here and you can see, you know, the 1905 rugby ball, which I know is on the people's collection when I have the time, because I think that could be a nice way then that people could not just have the access to a public spreadsheet on the internet, but they could maybe click through to immediately find the videos or images from that game. Um, and that would be a nice way then to stimulate you in different ways, not just have the reading, but the visuals and the video. But rugby is really underserved in um, photography and video in terms of what's available online. A lot of it's still locked in archives of, and like other sports like the NFL, which is fantastically served by that kind of thing. Well, that leads us on actually to the next question. Um, you exactly. mentioned on the, uh, by any relation, Lloyd, I wonder. Um, you mentioned, James, in the uh, Blood and Mud podcast that you'd like to write an accompanying version for American football. Mm-hmm. Uh, where does the research start with that one? And that's from Lewis Roderick. Well, yeah. So when I, what I did, when I pitched the book, because once I came up with the idea for the book, I realised it's, would apply across any sport or any team. You could do a Manchester United one, you could do a you know, New York Knicks one, whatever it was, whatever sport. And I love American football. It's my favorite sport after rugby. So what I actually did to go to the publishers, I did a 70, I hired me and Raluca, the artist. We did two 70 page treatments. We did the first 70 pages of the Welsh book with about 10 illustrations. And we did 70 pages of an NFL book. And then we went to the publishers and said, look, this is what we 
envisage it's translatable across any sport, any series. Um, and it got a really good response to doing that. And the NFL one, it, I mean, it's in some ways a bit easier because the NFL one, I've again, I've got a bit of a library of that, but the resources online are, are much stronger, much more available. Um, but the other good thing about the NFL one is because it it's going to be a history of the whole league. In some ways, you don't have to dive into as much detail like I did with every match result for Wales because Wales have played like 740 odd matches now. So the hour, I mean, I'm, I've been working on the England one for six months now and I'm up to 1950. You know, it's such a slow process. So in, in some ways, the NFL one's slightly easier because it's more of a big picture of the whole league and it's more top level. But I really, that, I'm really looking forward to doing that one after the England one, hopefully. Um, and doing the same thing, setting it in the society that shaped the game as well. We do have one more question. Um, this is from Peter Jones. Uh, from my point of view, I'm always struck by how much the game has changed during this time. Um, this is from 1905 onwards. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that the game um, as played in 1905 is so different to what we'll see in Paris on Saturday? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think the game in Paris on Saturday is going to be unrecognisable to games just 20 years ago. I mean, rugby, since professionalism, you know, the first five years of professionalism was just the guys were a little bit bigger, but um, it was still essentially the same sport. Then you had a period where they got fitter and stronger, and but there still wasn't the defences you've got now. And the law, and there's no probably no game in the world, even American football, that the laws have changed so much. And part of that has been the response of the guys getting bigger and pro. So the game, to, you can't compare the this decade to the 2000s. You can't compare the 80s to the 70s almost. It's just one of those sports that never stops changing. And um, in a way, it's just like the spirit of, um, it's the spirit of the sports the same in some ways. And I don't mean that in some sentimental rugby values, but this idea of 15 men against 15 men or now 15 women against 15 women competing, battering themselves. The injuries have changed a bit, but battering themselves um, and trying to find ways to innovate, trying to find ways to win, trying to, and then enjoying it. So yeah, it's to me in a way, rugby's every era is a different, and it's a fun bit at the beginning of the book that when rugby started, and even by the 1880s, people were saying the game was going soft because they were starting to outlaw that you could no longer kick someone's shins when they ran past, you know. So the game was, you know, the game was going soft, and French men might start playing it. But if you take hacking, play, you know. So that's the other fascinating thing is just trying to show people that since rugby started and left the public schools of England, people have complained that it's too soft, it's getting softer, and it's not the same game anymore. And we'll be saying it in 10 years' time as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Um, I, has anyone else got another question? Um, oh, they are coming in. Um, does the book cover, uh, does the book cover how many different versions of the Prince of Wales feathers have been worn by the national team over the last 140 years? I think it did, didn't it? Yeah. So there's a, there's a section in the middle where we've out, Anne Cake Bread, a Welsh artist, helped me um, illustrate every shirt ever, ever worn by Wales, every style. The feathers themselves haven't changed that much. Um, it's, it was probably like off the top of my head, like seven or eight iterations before the 90s when they, they trademarked it and standardized it. And since then, the feathers have not really changed in, in 20 odd years. But that section of the book is um, was one of the most difficult sections, actually, because we've had all these shirts over the 104 years. It was essentially the same shirt for 100 years, but it's changed all the time now. But again, rugby's underserved by visuals. So... I was having to try and clarify what shirt was worn in certain games. And that wasn't as easy as you'd think um, because there's not pictures of them online or there's no videos of those games online. There's all these gaps in it. And then I also had these weird things in my head. I knew I'd seen a photo growing up of JPR Williams with an Umbro logo on, on a shirt, which wasn't done in those days on the Welsh shirt. And I eventually found out there was like one game in 1975 where Wales, for some reason, had a manufacturer's logo on, on the outside of the shirt. And then I um, put that in the book. So we, I was trying to get to that level of detail, but this is the kind of thing where I'd love if fans started uploading all the resources they have, it would be easier to try and find these pictures because it's just so many games where there's just no pictures online, but they're sitting somewhere in archives or rugby clubhouses fading in the sunlight. There's, there's a, a lovely question come in, James, um, which I believe is back from your the the last of your, your illustrious <laughs> illustrious list of former clubs hello from yeah. nurse nursco rugby will you yeah. publish a big a book on your second favorite team this is actually quite so for those nursco is a 
town in Czech Republic, 4,000 people where I play. And when I have the time, I don't play anymore because I'm injured, but I coach when I can, when I have the time, but I, I used to coach them. And there's a really funny story. That club's only existed about four years now. Um, and randomly, nothing to do with this project. And it's referenced in the book, actually. Some filmmaker from the film school in Prague, which is a really prestigious film school, decided to do a, a, a documentary, like a fictional documentary on rugby. And he decided to do an idea of a team coming to what was then Czechoslovakia to play the thing. And he heard about Nierska Rugby Club. So he randomly picked Nierska Rugby Club. And randomly, the team he decided to make this fictional documentary about was that Wales were going to Czechoslovakia to play this small village team. And the documentary is like a five, it's a film that's being submitted to film festivals this year, but it's less than 10 minutes, but it's about this town preparing for Wales coming to play. So it's completely random. Um, and, I, and I was like, this is so bizarre. Not only is there a rugby club in this small town I was living in for a while, just before I got there, they founded, there's now a documentary about Wales playing them in the, in the 70s. So... Um, I definitely I put that in the book because it was too such a random thing. I'm actually going to do an interview with the director and put it on the blog because it's such a bizarre story for, to see and, and, and fun coincidence of life as well. Is, is there another question, Griffith? There's one more in the... Yeah, we do have one, one interesting one about, about resources, actually, um, from a student um, researching the first golden age of Welsh rugby. Um, if you just quickly then, if you could sum up, what advice would you give to finding resources regarding the relationship between rugby and workers, um, apart from, of course, buying a copy of uh, an illustrated history of yeah. Welsh rugby? I think, I mean, the, the starting point and the, the really big thing is, is historians like Gareth Williams and David Smith, who did the Fields of Praise. Um, Gareth Williams has done other books like the 1905 and all that, that really go into the social history um, and are really good resources. Other writers like Hugh Richards have, have done stuff, but there's a lot of academic resources out there that I started going into at the beginning. If you, you know, you can, I can't remember the names, but you can Google, there's a lot of academic papers on online as well and journals about this kind of relationship but because my book couldn't go that deep I, I only kind of went surface level on that but to be honest one of the starting places people like you know the fields of praise is just the classic book it came out in 1980 you can pick it up on ebay or go to the library but people like gareth williams are, would definitely be a starting point really good professors on this area and, and i'd suggest as well um that any student working on dissertation they're, they're very welcome to get in touch with the uh, subject librarian as well uh, just but, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> well Diolch and Vaur um, I think um, yeah, I think that's it for questions it's all the questions that have come in um, Diolch Vaur James thanks very much for your time it's been really really fascinating and seeing all the different well seeing the illustrations how they've been created and how you've used the resources to make a wonderful new book thank you and thank you for the opportunity and also for making all these resources accessible it's made a big difference so thank you